Welcome to MedHeads, the weekly show that brings a biopsychosocial focus to issues of the day, along with special guests who will showcase their expertise and enthusiasm about their field of practice. Your host, Dr. Fergal Armstrong. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Fergal Armstrong, and today on MedHeads, we have our regular guest, Marie Eisner. Marie, how are you today? I'm really well. How are you? Very well, very well. So today we're going to take the opportunity of chatting about emotional freedom technique and um, emotional eating. So mm. can you just run us through a little bit of the research that, that underpins this, this relationship? Okay, so Dr. Peter Stapleton did some work with a couple of other researchers um, and came to some pretty really good findings in response to the use of EFT uh, in mm. regards to emotional eating. So she's not the only one. There's other researchers out there who have come mm. up with similar findings. Um, but essentially, they've worked out that um, the findings suggest that people's emotional eating um, and cortisol levels drop quicker using EFT than if they were just experiencing talk therapy as part of their um counseling in response to emotional eating. So I suppose I, what I really should have done is go up the ski slope a little bit further before I ask that first question. What is emotional eating? Why is it a problem? Um, what is it? Okay, so emotional eating is essentially when we are eating for other reasons other than genuine hunger. Um, mm. So, uh, you know, a, a bit of a question we can ask ourselves is, you know, could sitting down to a plate of vegetables or, you know, whatever a general meal would be that's considered a, um, a health, like a, a generally healthy meal and mm. ask yourself, could I sit down and really eat that now? And if the answer is yes, well, then it's genuine hunger. Uh, mm. But if it's more like, oh, no, I don't really feel like that. I feel like something else. Then the question yes. tends to be, well, maybe it's not actually it's not really genuine hunger. And the other thing I remember reading was that genuine hunger tends to creep up much more slowly. And then all of a sudden, you know, you really are quite ravenous. Emotional yeah. eating tends to come on with really quite um, sudden vengeance. Right. I mean, when I was growing up, my brother, I always remember my brother and my mother having this fight about him not finishing his dinner. Oh. And he, and he would say, Mom, I'm not hungry for my main course. I'm only hungry for my pudding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what's, what's going on there? <laughs> uh, and one of the things I would be curious to know is, look, we know that certain foods can certainly make us feel good momentarily. We know that, you know, certain foods, you know, spike us, uh, spike our, our um you know, some foods are just more tempting. Some, some of them really, you know, cause a, a great big stirring in our, with our taste buds. But interestingly enough, one of the things that I'd be curious to know about that is, has your brother had um, positive experiences or some other pleasant memories associated with the pudding? So sometimes certain foods link us back to a moment in time and what we're really wanting is the experience of what that food was because that's how the brains couple the association. Right, right. Well, I'd, I'd have to ask him. I mean, it's just when you described emotional eating, that's the first thing that I thought of is, you know, I'm not hungry for my dinner. I'm only hungry for my pudding. Yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, that's usually because there's like, you know, the, the taste or the sweetness or the, or the cravings for the sugar or the, the carbs and all the stuff uh, that's yeah, so sugar cravings, very tempting. It? Yeah. yeah, it can be. Yeah. yeah. Or sometimes people actually crave like crispy things or, you know, and there's some sort of uh, theories around that if we're what depending what we're sort of craving um, we can be attracted to certain foods depending on what our emotional state is so some people who crave like potato chips or crunchy stuff it couldn't there can be certain things driving behind that other things if right. they're chowing down ice cream can be like seeking soothing in other ways so sometimes the food that we're uh, gravitating to can be worthy exploring in itself Right. So, so this, this brings me on to the concept of craving. I mean, what you're saying is emotional eating is any eating that is, that is carried out when you're not hungry. And then I think of craving. Now, like there are certain conditions where you have mineral cravings. So for instance, people with abnormal uh, adrenal function can sometimes have salt craving. 
Mm. Uh, so, but then, you know, salt craving might, might manifest itself as this voracious appetite for chips. Yes. You know, you might not know that. So, and, you know, and that might very easily uh, come over as, you know, emotional eating. Uh, so I just wonder, is the definition of emotional eating that you've given, is it, is it accurate enough? You know, or, or is there room for other things? Oh, no. And I know some people who have actually like had really significant cravings for steak. I know other women who have actually had incredible cravings for uh, certain like milk. Um, and yeah. perhaps sometimes I think sometimes the other thing, though, is to, to work out, you know, there's also another thing that I like to work on. And that is around when we eat intuitively, when we're really actually asking our our bodies what we're really needing. Now, I know mm. I've. I've had, as I said, clients who have been actually quite low in, in um, iron and they've mm. actually had like a really big craving for for a steak or something full of, you know, perceived mm. you know, or some iron or whatever. And that's absolutely right. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you actually brought that up because I think the difference is it's about emotional eating tends to also be where somebody will eat what they need to eat, but then they can't stop. So say for the person who might be low in sodium, they're gravitating toward the packet of chips because that's actually, they're really, they're needing the, the salt. Yeah. The difference will be is that, can they just have that one packet of chips or do they then mm. go and get another packet of chips? And then because they feel so miserable that they've eaten the chips, they then go back and buy the whole confectionery aisle. Yeah, yeah. So I think I, I think that's the difference that there's a there's a couple of uh, subtle differences around that. Yeah, and I suppose you've also alluded to one of the key things about uh, about non appetite driven behaviour. Uh, you know, the dopamine rush, sugars, refined sugars, give us a, a dopamine rush. Refined carbohydrates give us a dopamine rush, which is why I think we find sweet things so so pleasant. And mm. there, I've, other other experts have also suggested to me that one of the reasons why we are programmed to eat sweet things is that in nature, sweet things are not poisonous. Mm. So, you know, we have got a, a, an inbuilt genetic predisposition to crave sugar as mm. more so as more so as children than as adults. Yes. Hmm. So there are a number of elements, and if I could summarize what we've talked about, you've defined emotional eating as eating without being hungry. You've refined that to eating or, be, or being unable to stop eating, and you've acknowledged perhaps exceptions, including various cravings, which could be due mm. to salt craving or, or iron deficiency. And mm. we've, 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 we've just touched on the role of refined foods and sugar foods in, in dopamine. So you, let's go back to the research. So what you're saying then is that there's research out there that proves that, emotional, that EFT, emotional freedom technique, reduces cortisol. How does that relate to emotional eating? Is there research out there that says EFT reduces emotional eating? Yeah, that's the really exciting thing. So we know that a lot of the research suggests that cravings and relationships to food can change by about 75%, which is pretty, pretty awesome findings for people who are struggling with their um, with emotional eating. Um, but there's some connection between high cortisol levels. And I've seen this happen many times where people are between high cortisol levels and what? Oh, sorry, high cortisol levels and depression and anxiety. And I've right. seen uh, where a lot of people have been um, exercising, following really um, a really good, you know, healthy lifestyle plan. And then, but if their stress levels are up really, really high and they cannot get to sleep, and you would know this as a doctor, that their cortisol levels in um, allowing the body to settle and um, Get a, get a good night quality sleep. If that sleep's also compromised, you can exercise and pretty much monitor what you eat, but it's going to be a lot harder to move the weight because high crease, there's some research to suggest that increased um, cortisol levels uh, have some connection with the accumulation of the fatty stores around um, in the fatty tissues. Mm. Have you stumbled across that? You, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So are you saying that, so actually you've just touched on another issue that this brings to mind. High, so stress causes, we all know stress causes the fight, flight or uh, freeze uh, reaction, but stress also causes in, on the, in the longer term a hypercortisolemia. Are yes. you saying then that some of the reasons why stress causes uh, insomnia 
is related to hypercortisolemia, those elevated cortisol levels? That's the first question. And the second question mm. is, are you saying then that EFT can be used to help people with insomnia? Yeah, there has, there has been people that have used um, EFT to bring the cortisol levels leading up to sleep and it has actually improved their sleep, uh, getting to sleep because they've, they've, especially one of the things that happens when people are highly anxious is their mind is at it and it's blah, 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 blah. And they, they need to bring some mm -hmm. technique to at least still the mind. Yes. And I've seen clients use EFT very, very well before, you know, leading up to going to bed to actually bring their, uh, just to stop that mental chatter and to bring some of that anxiety down. And they have found a correlation with it improving their sleep. Okay, Marie, so let's summarize what we just talked about. So what you're saying is that high cortisol causes insomnia, emotional freedom technique can help reduce high cortisol, can help reduce insomnia, can also help reduce comfort eating, uh, emotional eating and stress. Now, here's a question for you. Do you think that high cortisol is associated with emotional eating? I think what happens is people try to get away from the emotions that they're feeling and the stress from everyday life, I think, is also yeah. not helping either. So right. people are trying to, like I've seen this happen with so many certain professions, highly right. stressed, not much left for them at the end of the day, and they'll go to the pantry. It's like there's just something there that's not going to put a demand on them, then that's not going to squeal, make noises, annoy them, and there's just that little bit of, oh, there's something left for me at the end of the day. And usually what happens is because we're living in such a fast-paced, stressed world that there's some sort of seeking of comfort in the in the pantry or the fridge and i suppose it's because it's so easy to you know to access food now i mean you can just unwrap a chocolate bar and there you are you've got an instant dopamine sugar rush absolutely you don't you just to, to, no that's right you, you know you go to pay for petrol and guess what's in front of you when you go to tap your card for your purchase yeah. And I think the other thing is food is, and this is one of the things that people with emotional eating uh, find so, so difficult is that, you know, if someone's got a, uh, if someone's got a, a, a relationship with heroin or they've got a relationship with ice, it's not as available as every second shop you walk into. So yeah. there's that constant reminder of, you know, willpower or the need for willpower when it comes to food, which I think some people who have other addictive issues don't have to have in the forefront of their psyche every single time, as opposed to somebody who has that when it comes to emotional eating. And a lot of people yeah. eat in, in they, no one will know what they're suffering. That's the, both the, the blessing and the curse, I think, with uh, emotional eating is no one really can see how, what goes on behind the scenes for people who have that kind of relationship with food. It can really go yeah. by the wayside. And I mean, you know, you mentioned ice as, as, a, as a prototypical example of an addiction. But I mean, let's talk about alcohol. So, I mean, you know, alcohol causes a physiological dependency, but I think there's a huge time frame between starting your first ever drink and then developing physiological dependency, during which I think the drivers to drink alcohol uh, or to consume it at harmful levels are more emotional, psychological than they are physiological. And, um, mm. you know, I would imagine that, 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 you know, stress plays a big part in that kind of uh, harmful alcohol consumption. Would you, would you agree or disagree with, with that? Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. But if you mm. think about a child who perhaps has uh, parents that are bluing and there's a lot of conflict, or you have a, ch um, a young person who's getting, you know, perhaps bullied at school, and they know they don't know it, um, you know, without sort of any sort of major awareness. But the moment they can get themselves home, and the only thing that they may have at their disposal mm. is food. Yeah. And how yeah. easy is it to pull slices of bread out of the freezer? How easy is it to get into the the biscuit barrel? Um, yeah. See how it happens. Yeah. So, so we've kind of touched on the relationship, the the research base. That, that, that validates emotional freedom technique as a, as a treatment mm. for emotional eating. Let's move on to diets. <laughs> <laughs> no. They all, they all work while, while you're on them. <laughs> Why do people struggle with diets? Because more often than not, there is a, it sends off this deprivation response. And the human behavior 
the moment we say, right, chocolate's off, off limits, what's the first thing we do? We start craving it. The moment we mm. say to ourselves no or somebody else tells us no, we will protest. We'll get into yeah. battle about it. We yeah. don't like to have – sometimes people firstly don't like to be told no and other people certainly don't want to be denied that chance of having whatever they want when they want it. Mm. So – the, the deprivation response is that that's a very I, I haven't actually heard that phrase before, but I, I'm thinking about it and I really like it. The deprivation <laughs> response. Is that the reason why in the long term diets don't work? Yeah, because I don't think they actually address the emotional, you know, I don't think they address the emotional issues in the long run because we have we, we have deeper reasons why the relationship with food keeps coming back and that any sort of eating plan won't do that. They may change behaviourally. They might say, well, if you have idle hands in the evening, go and start taking up crocheting or uh, go and start knitting or do something else or go and start painting your fingernails and all this sort of stuff, which is wonderful from a behavioural perspective. Yeah. But behind the scenes, as I've often said, you know, researchers suggest that anywhere between 85, 95% of our behaviour is driven by the unconscious. Yeah. which means we've got only 5%. If, if that's the case, then we may at most have anywhere from 15 to 5% of our conscious, um, conscious response in battle with our unconscious. It, it's not looking favourable. Yeah. It's like oh, a look, heavyweight look, versus a lightweight. <laughs> uh, you're, you're preaching to the converted if you're trying to say that the, uh, the limbic brain, the mammalian brain, in a fist fight with your frontal cortex, <laughs> your mammalian brain will always win. <laughs> yeah. I totally. mean, that's why, uh, ultimately, that's why we all have a job, isn't it? <laughs> if, if we could actually say to people, all you've got to do it's think about being a better person and not using substances and not emotionally eating and don't worry it's only anxiety you know we wouldn't <laughs> we wouldn't have a job would we <laughs> not at all no not no. at all and that is so correct <clears throat> yeah all right so why do people struggle with diets where's the struggle in a diet i mean you've said, you've talked about the deprivation response but but mm. you know i know people who have had huge successes with diet. I mean, you look at the Jenny Craig and the Weight Watchers adverts and they're, they're these, these, these individuals with the before and after photographs and they're all looking so slim and trim. Why does it not work for everyone? Look, you know, I think I saw something and it was rather um, sobering, very unpleasant findings that was there somewhere like 90 or 95% of people on diets actually, you know, in 12 month follow up, the, they've the gone either back to their they've either gone back to their previous weight that they were, or if not, they've actually gained. So you lose the weight and you get interest. Mm, so you, yeah. you gain, you put the weight back on plus interest because the metabolism doesn't tend to kind of like that uh, sense of starve or, you know, uh, deprivation or starving. The body tends to kick up yeah. and uh, start to get into a bit of a battle about that. Yeah. Um, so in answer to your question, because I think what happens is, we get runs on the board, we get the momentum, we might see the scales shifting, we might be able to take our measurements and we kind of think, yeah, that's great, that's great. But if there's emotional stuff that's sitting behind the, sitting behind the screen, that, if that's not focused on, yeah. it will sabotage down the track. And I, yes. I, I, see, I see people's inner, inner saboteur running the show so often and they, they genuinely, really, for one, don't often understand that we have an inner saboteur in us. So that can be quite yeah. enlightening when I discuss that with people. But yeah. the other thing is to understand that, you know, there's, there tends to be a number of things that can be going on behind the scenes. So even if people are getting the goals, you know, measurements are coming down, scale weights looking wonderful, they're getting all the compliments from everyone around the place about how good they're looking, something will usually uh, hijack, hijack that down the track and that's when they'll be prone to just, you know, slipping and then falling back into a heap again. All right, so you've said two key words that, that triggered me. One is sabotage and the other one is hijack, right? So firstly, did you know that saboteur, sabotage, comes from the French word sabot, which means a wooden clog. And it is these wooden clogs that the weavers of France used to destroy the newfangled weaving machines that were putting them out of livelihood. So no, I, I did have, not know that. <laughs> I had to just tell you that, right? Right, so sabotage. 
So what you're saying then is that the ability to diet, you know, that, that first 12 months of when, when your prefrontal cortex is in control, you know, there's a, there's a, a brain at the pilot, and then all of a sudden the brain has to take a, 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 a snooze, and then all of a sudden issues sabotage all your good work. So is it right to say then, is this what you're saying, that, that unless you concomitantly deal with the underlying emotional triggers for eating, you have no hope of losing weight if you've got I a weight problem. I haven't, I haven't seen that myself. I, that's my, my own personal experience. Yeah, in your experience, unless you deal with the emotional baggage, eventually yep. it'll come back and, pardon the pun, bite you on your ever-expanding rear end. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And like one of my favorite sayings is, you know, what you eat in private, you will wear in public. In time, oh, I love in that. Course. I love that. <laughs> what you eat in private, you'll wear in public. Moment on the lips, lifetime on the hips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, and, yeah. and, you know, getting back to that deprivation thing, it's one thing to sit there and say, okay, I'm going to have a chocolate bar or I'm going to have a few pieces of chocolate at night. But for someone yeah. who's got emotional eating, those, if those two bits of chocolate then go back to a story in someone's head of, uh, I, I can't see, I've got no willpower. See, look, I can't even sit there. Two, two bits would just be, you know, diabolical. That will just lead me to eating the whole pack. Yeah. You can so see how, bit, yeah. yeah, you see how going on a diet's not going to work. Yeah, it's also a bit like the alcohol phrase where they say the one's not enough, but no, a hundred, one's too much, but a hundred's not enough. That's right. Once exactly. you've started, once, once your defenses have been breached, as it were, um, you know, your willpower just disappears and it's a complete rout. And, you know, and the, the mammalian uh, brain that just wants to eat and eat and eat. Now, you That's also right. used so, to... Yeah. Sorry, go on. Go on. And I was just going to say some of the things and some of the uh, unconscious things that will often be going on that need the attention, because this is where a lot of people get confused. They'll say, yeah, but I'm doing all the right things. And But the, the, the things that come to sneak around behind the, the backs, the the back part is the things around, you know, if somebody starts to lose uh, weight, some mm. people fear that they may not, if, if, as I said, I think I alluded to this in a previous discussion with you around if someone's got a history of some sort of trauma or where they've been body shamed, they might mm. be then worried that if they get down to a certain size, that they may get unwanted attention, they might start getting wolf whistled, you know, they might walk past a construction site and someone might start leering or carrying on and that could uh, ricochet into a sense of feeling unsafe or, or powerless, especially if they've had a history of some sort of sexual trauma or where, where they've felt body shame in the past um, mm. around their uh, uh, what they've connected with their uh, uh, attractiveness. The other things can be is, um, and I alluded to this last time, is where people have actually put on crave certain foods because of, it's been connected with a certain special time in their life, such as getting married or having holidays with a grandparent who used to make really rich, comforting, um, yummy foods. Mm. Um, the other one is if somebody lost all the weight and then they had to walk into, and this is a, a technique I get my clients to go through, if they, if they lost their weight and they were in a really nice outfit and feeling really confident and really proud, and then they walked into a room, who out of their family and friends would be the ones to look negatively at them? Because sometimes the tribes that we're around or the tribes we've come from would frown upon somebody stepping out and finding their, you know, what I've, well, what, you know, when I refer to them finding their north facing compass, if all of a sudden they start to really get into alignment with what they are, who they wanna be, and then they get that disparaging look from family members who are like, wait a minute, you're not allowed to upstage us. You're not allowed to uh, break out of this clan. You know, you see, how many times do you see family members where there's food is almost like part of the part of the bonding and the joining? Well, I thought food was a part of the bonding and joining for every family. You know, we all sit down together to eat. Yeah, and how often sometimes do people get triggered? Some of the biggest atrocities have gone on in our families, and then we you see how many people around the family Christmas dinner. All of a oh. sudden get triggered <laughs> <laughs> we could devote a whole episode to that how awful is your christmas dinner <laughs> and how many times do people end up seeking therapy because you oh know, they yes know that, 
Sorry, no, Marie, I need to make an appointment with you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it happens all the time. And how many it times does. do people go with their partners to a family dinner that they may not have been, they may not have even ever had their first meeting of the family, and uh, then all of a sudden they're well, a, what they thought was a very well-adjusted partner, all of a sudden was regressing before their very eyes, and they're like, <laughs> you're not the person I fell in love with. What in goodness is names going on? Oh, dear, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so there's, let's unpack all of this a little bit. So, first of all, you know, we're talking about weight loss, right? Or, or sorry, we're talking about being overweight, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about emotional eating. And you've alluded to the fact that some people uh, don't want to lose weight because psychologically they actually don't want the attention that is associated mm -hmm. with being thin, right? Mm -hmm. That's basically one of the things you've said, yeah? So if therefore, they've history, if they've had a history of trauma or where they've yeah, been yeah. desired at one point and then something yucky has gone on in that experience. Right. So being thin equates to unwanted attention. Yeah. Some people will, will, will make that connection. Yes. Right. OK. <clears throat> Why is it then? Oh, sorry. To what extent does does culture permeate that basic relationship between thinness and attention. And, and the, what I'm trying to say is, look, in the, 19, in the 18th century, Hans Holbein painted beautiful women and they were all fat. You know, in yes. certain cultures of the world, fat is beautiful. And totally. So that is to so what correct. Extent, so to what extent are we, is this, is, is, is this, is this a real thing, this, this phenomenon, or is it just a, a psychosocial construct developed by the rich Western world? You know, you know, where is the truth or is there a truth that, 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 that can navigate through these seemingly opposing um, uh, views? You know, is, is it actually better to be thin or is it better to be fat? I don't personally, I think it's about how do you feel like I, I seen, I've seen some women who have actually felt more comfortable having a little bit of being a bit rounded. I know some guys that do not like stick creature women. They don't like thin women. Um, so I think there's a lot of, you know, and you're right, certain cultures, the more voluptuous you are, the more you are actually desired. I think that but if you look at, say, you know, your Victoria's Secret models, if you look at a lot of what has been gone, you know, going on in certainly in, in our culture, well, certainly in Australia, thin is perceived as better. But what's often happened is, is if that? somebody has... Why in Australia is thin better? Why in the Western I, world is thin better? You'd have look that'd have to be you have to follow that through with sociologists and all that sort of stuff. And I, look, I, I've seen the most. I've seen people incredibly thin, but they're not even happy in their self, in themselves, yeah. even when they are incredibly thin. Yeah. How can you be happy when you're pushing around a lettuce on your on your fork? Well, and that's exactly <laughs> right. And 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 yeah. you know, as I said. I know some people, some people who don't have emotional issues with food can eat a little bit of everything and feel quite satisfied in having eaten a little bit of everything. Um, the taste buds have gone into a little party and that's all wonderful. But because they're not battling the other side that then kicks in around the corner and goes, oh yeah, look, you've got no control, you're this, you're that. Um, the other triggers that can be uh, related to emotional eating are things like the story around when people have had a history of being in the war where food may have been incredibly scarce, the legacy yeah. that lives on for intergenerationally around, you know, uh, clean your plate. Some people really yeah. feel like they're, uh, they're breaking a vow if they go to scrape their leftover food into the bin. It's like they're, oh my gosh, yeah. the anxiety yeah. kicks in because they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are a lot of cultural drivers. Oh, big time. You know, <laughs> big time. So are we ever going to have a <laughs> are we ever going to have a conversation, do you reckon, about emotional starvation <laughs> as opposed well, to emotional that's... eating? <laughs> well, I mean, and then that opens up a whole thing even around, you know, the whole area of anorexia nervosa, which is another topic mm. in itself. All right. Okay. We'll, we'll steer away from that for today. So <laughs> let's let's recap a little bit. What, what have we talked about? We've talked about the fact that unless you deal with the emotional baggage that is, that, that, that is associated with the cause, the underlying cause of your being overweight, any attempt at dieting is going to be sabotaged or hijacked because your, your vigilance, your dietary vigilance is going to wane. And the minute that happens, 
you will be exposed to some kind of stressor or trauma that bang hijacks your 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 route towards weight loss and mm. bang out comes the chocolate and the crisps at night and the ice cream mm. and what you're saying then is emotional eating can be can be helped with emotional freedom technique Yes, and part of that is actually unpacking those unconscious blockers, those the, yeah. the, the way that the saboteur will, will, you know, command the stage. Yeah, so, so, okay, so I've got two questions. The first question is, do you think that, that for optimal weight management in this context, that, 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 that a one-off session or for emotional freedom technique or multiple sessions for emotional freedom technique need to occur? Do you, is it a one-off uh, uh, appointment to see you or is it a weekly appointment to see you? What, what's the best, what's the best no, way of, of doing this? No, that's usually a weekly, that would be a weekly appointment. And I usually encourage people to at least have about at least six, somewhere between six and 10 sessions because yeah. there's different scoring on the different unconscious blockers that can be there that yeah. have, have greater weight. Yeah, right. Okay, so you we so this is not a one-off. It's not as if you can decide to go on a diet, see Marie, get fixed, and then go off and lose two, three stone and be forever happy. That's just not going to happen. This is a journey, and it, and it, and this requires the, the management of emotional eating requires a relationship with a counselor such as yourself. Right. Second mm -hmm. question: the blockers. Mm. What are the top three? What are the most malevolent blockers that you've come across? The top three, if there is, if there is such a thing. Personally, the one that I see causes people the, the greatest amount is the if there's a history of sexual trauma or a time where a person has been shamed or made to feel ashamed in their body. So, yeah. you know, if someone's had a history of sexual abuse, say for argument's sake, they were, I don't know, eight, nine and something's happened their brain may think, oh, I was eight or nine when, and I was quite thin and I was skinny and that happened to me. Yes. So that can, be, that can be one thing. It's like, oh, my gosh, I felt powerless. I felt like I couldn't tell the perpetrator to leave me alone. Some people do actually um, equate being thin with not being able to fight their way out or, or uh, uh, get rid of a predator, especially if, yeah. if something like that's happened. So that would be my, one of yeah. the first ones. The other one I think is very big is relationship to an authority figure. And I didn't really touch on that today, but it's something I think I've spoken to you about before, which is well, remind where we us. Feel... Okay, so the authority figure is where somebody in our past, usually our significant caregiver, has taken away our rights or taken away our freedom to some extent, where there's been a confusion around care versus control. So a parent mm. who turns around and says, no, I don't want you to... Uh, cut the bread with that knife, you could actually cut yourself or hurt yourself is quite different to no, I'm saying no, because I'm saying no. So right. the more that we feel like we've had our liberties or our freedom taken from us, we're more likely to rebel. And that's where we'll internalize the authority figure in us and start the battle from within, which is a big one. That would be another right. one. And the other thing I think would also be the clean the plate. If someone's really got that Every time you go to put leftovers in the thing or you go to a family member's house and they load the plate up and then you're stuck with this ugh, horrible feeling of going towards the bin trying to escape. Uh, you know, how many yeah. times do people sit there and hide the food and then give it to the dog that's wagging its tail under the table? Because yeah, to do yeah. that means they're going to end up in battle with the family if they try to get yeah. rid of the food in the rubbish bin. They're the three right. that I would say would be the biggest ones. Right. So we've got history of sexual abuse, uh, a, a maladaptive relationship with authority figures and clean the plate. Mm. Marie, thank you so much for yet again your fabulous pearls of wisdom and I really do look forward to chatting with you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. That's all for today's MedHeads. My name is Dr. Fergal Armstrong and thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.